Hey everybody, hope you're doing well today. Today we are going to cover the skeletal lab. When we're looking at the skeletal lab, we begin by talking about the two different parts or regions of the body overall. And you may notice that on page nine of our lab manual at the top it says skeletal system axial. And then you flip a couple pages over and you get to page 12 and it says skeletal system appendicular. So these are the two main regions, the axial and the appendicular areas. We kind of talked about this previously, but don't forget that axial means the head and the trunk or the torso. And appendicular refers to your appendages and also what's called the girdles, the bones or the things that connect the appendages to your torso. So um, starting basically at your scapula and your clavicle and down to your arm, that's the upper appendicular and starting with your hip bone and down through the leg, that's going to be the lower appendicular and then everything else, the skull, the vertebrae, the rib cage, the sacrum at the bottom of the vertebrae. These are components of the axial skeleton. So this is how we're going to divide this chapter up. To begin with, <clears throat> let's take a look. And I know this is a kind of a messy slide with a lot of labels on it, but this is the only one of this colored skull that I could grab. I wanted to start out with this colored skull to point out the basic bones of the skull. There's two groups of bones in the skull. The first are called the cranial bones. These are listed on page nine of our lab manual. And the cranial bones are everything that surrounds and protects the brain. And then on the next page, you can see it discuss the facial bones. And so the cranial bones surround the brain, so these big flat bones protect the brain. And then this stuff that's kind of in front of it is your facial bones. So first off, let's start with the first basic bone, and that is the frontal bone. So here, this yellow bone is the frontal bone, so your forehead. Right behind it, we have the parietal bones, and here's another view. Behind frontal was parietal, and behind the parietal, making the back and the base of the skull, is this blue occipital bone. Now, on each side, there are there is a temporal bone, this brown bone. This is where your ear is located. So there's your ear hole or your external auditory meatus. So it's located in this temporal bone. And again, there's one of these on each side. Now, the next cranial bone is this really weird shaped red one. I'm going to point this out later. But definitely give yourself a note. This is the sphenoid. And whenever we pull the sphenoid out, let me go back and show you. It's also kind of in the backs of the eye socket. When we pull this bone out, we kind of see it back here behind the jaw also. This bone looks like a bat. So give yourself a note. The sphenoid bone, a lot of times I like to call it the bat bone. Okay. One more little bone. And this is a small yellow bone that's kind of hidden back here on the medial side of your eye orbits. And we can see it there. It's yellow. And it's also right here, this yellow bone. This is called your ethmoid. So this ethmoid, just give yourself a note out beside ethmoid. I like to call it the box bone, the boxy bone, right? Because it kind of looks like it's got four sides. And we'll point it out a little bit better here in just a second. So those are the six bones that completely surround the brain and create the cranium. Now the rest of the bones are the facial bones. So first off, we can see the upper jaw bones are the maxillary bones. So here are these purple bones. There's two of them that fuse. You can even feel that fusion down the roof of your mouth. <clears throat> your cheek bones are called your zygomatic bones one on each side. <clears throat> this bone right here, it's really not easy to see, but this bone right here, this orange bone, really kind of tiger orange, is called the lacrimal bone. Let's go back over here. Here's this lacrimal bone again. It's kind of um, back, kind of on the back side of the nose. It's also right inside of the orbit of the eye. So if you kind of put your fingers in that region, you can even kind of feel this groove that's on that bone. And that groove is where we drain our tears down into our nose. So whenever we start to cry or we make too many tears, our nose starts to run, right? And it's because we're draining it down past this lacrimal bone and into our nasal cavity. <clears throat> now. 
This next one I don't really have a good view of, except for to go all the way over here and look at it right here. On the backside of the upper jaw, and you can barely see a little crack right here that's separating the maxillary bone here from this palatine bone. So the palatine bone is the back of the roof of the mouth, and many times that's the way I ask it. What is the back of the roof of the mouth? And this bone is the palatine bone. Now let's go back to our original slide that we were start, kind of started with and here we have our um, original skull again our colored skull so let's complete the rest of these bones here is the mandible the mandible is your lower jaw bone okay moves whenever we speak or we eat these bones on the bridge of the nose are your nasal bones and on the inside of the nose we've got these little bones that project from each side. Can't really see it in that view. It's tough to see here, but these are called the inferior nasal concha. We can see them right here. Okay, so there are the inferior nasal concha as well. Now this bone right here that makes the nasal septum or what divides your nose into the two nostrils, this bone is called the vomer. And this is not an easy one to see. Again, we can barely see it right here kind of scooping down and it's been pushed to the side a little bit. But there is that vomer and that's again what creates the um, nasal septum. Now those bones are the 14 bones that complete the skull. Those last bones that we just covered starting with this maxillary bone are the facial bones and again the other six are the cranial bones now let's start back over and let's use the white skulls to learn all of our parts i want you to use the colored skulls for the basic bones of the skull and some of our bones you can go ahead and make a note that some of the bones for example like the lacrimal bone the um, nasal bones the inferior nasal concha these guys can easily be pointed out on that colored skull model, but we want to learn all the details on the white skulls because that's kind of what I'm mainly going to test you on. Now, whenever we look here, don't forget, here's our frontal bone. And this frontal bone, the flat part of your forehead is referred to as the frontal squama. So the frontal squama, just the flat part of the forehead. And then we see these thick ridges above the eyes. These thick ridges above the eyes, these are the supraorbital margins or the supraorbital ridges. And on the superorbital margin or superorbital ridge, you may see a little cut or a little hole, right? Here's a hole on this left side, and over here looks like a cut on the right side. And so those are demonstrating the superorbital foramen and the superorbital notch, okay? Now on a test, I would more than likely ask you, what is either the hole or the cut that's above the eye? And then you could give me either of those last terms, foramen or notch. A foramen or a foramen is a hole. And a hole is where we see blood vessels and nerves going in and out of that bone. Again, the parietal bones, we've kind of already mentioned those, but back here are the parietal bones. That's all that we need to know about them. There's no details about these parietal bones. Again, behind that, we're going to start to see this occipital bone. And this occipital bone is going to make the back and the base of the skull. Whenever we take a look, whoops, let's go right here. We take a look right here. Here is this occipital bone on the back of the skull. And we see this point that's sticking out farther than everything else, right? So this point is called the external occipital protuberance. And this is just kind of, you can feel that kind of knot in the back of your head, and it's kind of where we start to make, you know, the back of the neck. It kind of constricts the skull and starts to make it the back of the neck. Again, this occipital bone is below this suture right here that we're going to name here in a little bit. This is our lambdoid suture, so we can kind of see under the upside down V is going to be that occipital bone. Now again, here's the back and here is the base of the skull. When we look at the base, we can see this big hole. This is the, one of the largest holes in our in our skeleton. This is called the foramen magnum or foramen magnum. And so the foramen magnum is obviously important for the spinal cord to exit the skull and to head down through the vertebral column so that we can get all that sensory information heading to the brain and all the commands that the brain creates back down to our muscles and our organs.
in front of and or kind of towards the front and to the side we see these nice smooth pads these nice smooth pads in front of and to the side of this foramen magnum is called the occipital condyles this is for our very first vertebrae that we're going to learn called the atlas to sit on and every time you say no go ahead and say no while you're listening to this you are pivoting on this joint right here on these occipital condyles so this is very important to allow us to say no let's go back and see kind of a view from the side and we're going to cover the temporal bone the temporal bone here my bad here's the temporal bone so again the temporal bone let's first find the ear hole and again the ear hole is properly called the external auditory meatus and then we can kind of see this crack right and that's forming the bone so we can see that crack and there's a little crack right there okay so this back part is belongs to the temporal bone and so ear hole, external auditory meatus, is in that temporal bone. So that's the easy way to find it overall. This flat part right above your ear, this is called the squamous part or temporal squama, just like we called it the frontal squama. We can also use that squamous or squama, which means flat, right? We know those cells. So there's the squamous part or temporal squama either way. Back behind and kind of below your ear just a little bit, you can feel this big knot, this big bony knot. This is called your mastoid process. The mastoid process is important for attaching muscles of chewing and speaking, and so it allows us to move our jaw, um, our lower jaw, our mandible. If you notice where the mandible attaches into the temporal bone right here, is and it's almost kind of yellow colored it's an off white color this is representing the joint this is the joint that a lot of people call the tmj joint the temporomandibular joint but really the part on the temporal bone that i want you to know is called the mandibular fossa so here's the mandible and it's fitting into this little dip a dip is called a fossa in a bone or in many other parts and so here this specific dip that the mandible attaches to is called the mandibular fossa now we see this entire curving structure right here it leaves from our zygomatic bone and it connects onto our temporal bone if we look at it from below from below is a great shot we can see it right here so here this is called our zygomatic arch and again the zygomatic arch is actually made out of two bones okay it's the fusion of the temporal bone and the zygomatic bone again do yourself a favor and draw a little crack right here so draw a little crack in your book to let you know that right here is where the temporal bone stops behind and the zygomatic bone begins in front of it okay now this part just the part of the temporal bone that makes the zygomatic arch this part is referred to as the zygomatic process so again the entire curving structure is called the zygomatic arch and on the temporal bone we have the zygomatic process we're going to learn over here on the zygomatic bone that this is called the temporal process and so we're going to name these processes many times if they touch another bone we're going to name it after the bone that we are touching now the petrous part I would like for you to mark out I'm not going to cover Petra's part that's on the inside I don't think it's all that important but this is kind of a, a pyramid shaped region on the inside where the inner ear is located and I'll point that out in another picture but I just don't want you to really worry about it for a test now our last thing under the temporal bone are going to be the jugular foramen and the carotid canal or carotid foramen when we look here at this underside view like we did with the foramen magnum and the occipital condyles I want you to go right beside those occipital condyles and right here we see this odd shaped hole and over here we see another one right there it's kind of oval so these odd shaped holes these are actually coming in at an angle that we can't see so they're kind of coming in at an angle right here these are for the large veins to come out of your skull the internal jugular vein so this is called your jugular foramen so right kind of to the side and just maybe a little bit towards the front of the occipital condyles are the foramen or the jugular foramen 
Now, right in front of these, we see these nice rounded off shaped holes, maybe a little oval, but nice and round, easy to find. These are the carotid foramen or the carotid canal. So the carotid artery, the internal carotid artery, is going to head into the skull and supply blood to the brain. And so here is the hole that they enter the skull through, the carotid canal or the carotid foramen. Now, again, Next is our sphenoid bone. I want to go way back here to that colored skull. Just to point out, sphenoid is the red bone, and it makes the backs of the eye socket. Whenever we pull it out and we actually look at it by itself, then we're going to see how much it looks like a bat, right? So here, this is our bat bone. This is the sphenoid. Now, I would prefer to simply ask you all questions on the sphenoid based on this model and the next one, which is also a, a superior view of the sphenoid. And this is an anterior view of the sphenoid. So this is like we're looking through the eye sockets right here. And we notice that on each side of this bat bone, here are some greater wings. So here are the greater wings of the sphenoid. And here, on the top, we have the lesser wings of the sphenoid. Okay. Now again, let's switch over to this picture. We notice here that these big main parts on the side, these are the greater wings. And then right here, almost kind of looks like part of a deviled crab. Here are the lesser wings. Now while we're looking here at this view, right behind the lesser wings, this is a big dip. Okay, and this big dip is actually a saddle. It's called the Turkish saddle. This big dip is called the Sella Tersica. And we don't really see it on this other view, but the Sella Tersica is what's responsible for holding the pituitary gland. So here's one view of the Sella Tersica. I also want to show you this internal view. Here again, if you notice, is a crack right here, if you can follow it. And so that makes this region on the inside of the skull the lesser wings. Here's your frontal sinus. So here's close to the front of your skull. There's that foramen magnum. Here's the occipital bone towards the back. And so here, a little bit more than halfway towards the front, we see the lesser wings. And right behind it, right here is that dip. There is the cella tersica one more time. Now, when we look on at this thing, all of this in the middle, okay, all of this in the middle of the sphenoid is the main part of the bone. And any time, excuse me, any time on a test that I ask you, what is the main part of a bone? Almost always, I'm looking for the term body. So this is the body of the sphenoid, okay? And again, this is just the body of the bat. Again, greater wings, lesser wings on top. And now we see these kind of legs hanging down. These are called the pterygoid processes. So these are the pterygoid processes. And these just kind of help form some of the most posterior portion of the back of your upper jaw. Now, let me show the rest of the sphenoid right here through this image. When we look at this, we can see these cracks in the back are called the orbital fissure. Okay, so these are the orbital fissure. Let me actually see if I've got a different view. Nope, I don't have a good view of this. But here's the orbital fissure. This is the superior orbital fissure. And then I'd like for you to add a label onto our list. I want you to know this part of this sideways V crack, the bottom part, is the inferior orbital fissure. So if we name the superior orbital fissure, we might as well name the inferior orbital fissure as well. You can barely see just a little bit right here. It's very difficult to see. But right above the apex of the V, we're going to see a little hole. And here's the side of that hole kind of shadowed right behind kind of this nasal region. This hole is where the optic foramen runs through, and this is called the optic canal. If I want the optic canal on the test, I would point to it and I'd say, this is important for a nerve from your eyeball to enter the brain. Okay, so important for a nerve from the eyeball to enter the brain. So that's the optic canal or the optic foramen.
Now, next bone that we're going to cover is the ethmoid bone. Here's a sideways view of the ethmoid bone. It's got almost this box shaped, almost kind of a rectangular box shape. If we see it from the front, it's also kind of a square box. It's got a lot of little ridges and, and little areas that poke out. This bone again, the boxy bone, is the ethmoid bone. And one way that you can notice it, it's got this weird box shape, but then it's got this thing that sticks up. It's almost like a little shark fin, right? So this shark fin that sticks up, or this spike that sticks up, is called the crista galley. So here is the crista galley. Now, let me show you another view. This bone, again, there was that sphenoid. This bone is kind of in front of the sphenoid. Right here is the crista galley sticking up, and it's sticking out in between the two main parts of the frontal bone. You don't have to worry about that on the inside of the skull. But you do need to be able to identify this little fin as the crista galley, and then all of this little dark and shadowed region underneath it. This is where we have nerves for your, for your sense of smell that go from the nasal cavity up into your brain and start to send that sensation of smell to your brain. This is called the cribriform plate. Okay, there's all sorts of olfactory foramina in there. You don't have to know that term, but all those little holes, if you can get a real good zoom view, are the olfactory foramina, and that makes this holy looking area at the base of the crista galley um, the cribriform plate, okay, that shadowed region. Everything else under ethmoid, I'm going to just mark it out for now. So we're not going to cover the perpendicular plate, and we're also not going to cover that olfactory foramina that I just mentioned. Now let's move on and let's take a look at our maxillary bone. So we just finished the cranial bones. Now we're going to start to look at the maxillary bones. Here we can kind of see is one maxillary bone and two maxillary bones. And so these two maxillary bones are your upper jaw bones. Where the teeth plug in to either the upper or the lower jaw are properly called the alveolus or alveoli, just like in your lungs. Um, but on our list, we have alveolar processes. And so um, the alveolar process is actually the ridge in between teeth. But I want you to know that the alveolus, or if you put alveolar process on the test, I would take it, that that's the socket, right? The alveolus is the socket um, where the tooth is connected into the skull, either in on the maxillary or maxilla, or down here on the mandible, either way. Now, when we look here, we can also see that there are these two holes, one under each eye socket, each orbit. These are called the infraorbital foramen. Don't forget that above the eye socket, we had the supraorbital foramen, and below the eye socket, we have the infraorbital foramen. Now, the infraorbital foramen is found on the main part of this maxillary bone. And so here is the main part of this maxillary bone. I'm kind of circling it. And again, anytime I ask you for main part of the bone on a test, I'm almost always 99.9% .9 of the time asking for the word body. So here is the body of the maxilla or the body of the maxillary bone. And on that body, we had that inferior orbital fissure. Now, if we take a look from below, and again, here's our inferior view, we can see that here is the bottom of the upper jaw or the roof of your mouth. And again, back behind here, draw that crack. Make sure that you've got this crack drawn. This is the um, suture that separates the palatine bone back here and these two parts of the maxillary bones up here. These two parts of the maxillary bones are called the palatine processes. And that's not too tough. The top, the roof of your mouth is called the palate. So these are the palatine processes <clears throat> and they are right in front of the palatine bone, okay? Not too difficult. Now, as I mentioned, let's take a look at this zygomatic bone next. The zygomatic bone is the cheekbone. So here is your cheekbone. You can see that crack right there representing the top margin of the zygomatic bone. You can see again this crack right here representing the most posterior parts of that zygomatic bone. And then it's kind of tough, but right here, starting diagonal, draw a line. You can barely see this crack right here, right? It's kind of going this way, okay? So this crack right here, just on the edge, this is the most anterior part of this zygomatic bone. So what we've really got is one 
two, three processes sticking out from our cheek. This process right here that sticks out towards the back and it touches the temporal bone, we're going to name it after the bone that we touch. So this process in front of that crack is called the temporal process and it's on the zygomatic bone. Don't forget that this process over here on the temporal bone that we called the zygomatic process. So your zygomatic arch is actually two processes. The zygomatic process of the temporal bone and the temporal process of the zygomatic bone. Now up here at the superior portion where it meets here, this connecting bone is called the frontal process because it connects over here to your frontal bone. And this wide part over here, kind of the anterior portion, this wide part is referred to as the maxillary process because it grabs a hold of the upper jawbone. Now again, if we come over here and we take a look at this colored skull, we can see what I'm talking about. Here's that frontal process. Here is that temporal process. And here is that maxillary process. Okay. Now again on this colored skull, don't forget there are the lacrimal bones. Okay. Um, I've already pointed out the palatine bones on the bottom of the skull. And then we have the mandible. Let's leave the mandible alone for just a minute and let's go cover the rest of the skull bones here on this colored skull. There's those nasal bones. And then here we see the inferior nasal concha. Almost a lot of times I like to refer to these as the boogie bones or the booger bones because they look like boogers on the inside of the nose. And then we have that that thin slit that creates the nasal septum, the vomer. And again, here's another great view. So we can see the nasal bones. We can also see the inferior nasal concha or the booger bones. And then we can see the vomer right here creating the nasal septum. Now, to finish up the skull as far as its parts, let's take a look at the mandible. Okay, here's a mandible kind of demonstrating cutting away the bone and kind of showing you how the teeth are rooted in there. When we look at the mandible, we've got two main parts. We've got this part that's a little more vertical and it connects up into the temporal bone. And then we've got this part that's a little more horizontal. And this part is where your teeth are located, right? This part where the teeth are located is referred to as the body. And this more vertical part that connects up to the temporal bone is called the ramus, which means arm in Latin. Okay. Now on the ramus, we see this nice, smooth, rounded protrusion on the backside. This again is what connected into the skull. And so we can see right here is that same part. Again, here's the ramus and here is the body. Whenever we look, this is called the condylar process. A condyle is a smooth round pad. We learned occipital condyles just a second ago. So there's a smooth round pad that connects up into the temporal bone at that mandibular fossa. So there's the condylar process. Now towards the front, we've got more of this spike and that spike is called the coronoid process. So the coronoid process is the spike. The condylar process is the more rounded off region. And in between, we've got a cut. Almost any time we have a cut in a bone, we're going to refer to it as a notch. So this is called the mandibular notch. Okay, so there's that mandibular notch. Now, when we look at the body, we can see that, again, we have where the teeth are going to be attached into the sockets and those sockets are called alveolus. If you want to call them alveolar processes, I'd take that. Again, the alveolar process is really a little ridge in between your teeth, the ridge of bone, but not that big a deal. On the front of the mandible, we can see this hole and this hole is the mental foramen, right? Mental foramen, mental foramen. So mental means chin and so there is the mental foramen or the mental foramen. Now, right here, you can see the part of the chin that sticks out more, and this is referred to as the mental protuberance. So the mental protuberance kind of sticks out farther than everything else at the tip of your chin. Now, let's go back over here. Let's take a look. So we see that coronoid process, condylar process, man, uh, the uh, mandibular notch. We also see ramus. We see body. There, they're trying to show us that mental foramen. And here we can see the alveolus. We can even see the alveolus down here or the alveolar process, which is actually that ridge in between. Either way, I'd take either term if I'm asking about teeth and bones. Okay. Now, really tough to see, but back here, this is a hole. 
on the inside of the ramus. The inside of the ramus, there's a hole that's coming, and you, you have to look at it from the top down in order to really see it. And this hole, again, is allowing blood vessels and nerves in, and this hole is called the mandibular foramen. So don't get these two confused. The mandibular foramen is on the inside of the ramus, and the mental foramen is on your chin. Okay. Now at that point, we have completed all of the skull. Okay. So the skull, I tend to make about one third of your entire test. If you don't know the skull, then you don't really know too much about the bone. So at this point, you really should start focusing hot and heavy on that skull, getting that information in as quick as you can so that you can move forward and start to get to the more complicated style of stuff. Now, this is one of the most complicated parts. And so, you know, learning these parts, they're very close together on the skull. So take your time right now and take a lot of time to do this. To make sure that you've learned these parts before you move any forward, um, any more forward with learning the, sc the skeleton. Okay. Now, once you feel comfortable with that skull, and hopefully that only takes you a week or less to feel comfortable, um, then let's start moving on and let's cover the rest of the actual skeleton. And then I'll put the appendicular skeleton on a different presentation. Okay. That way you can access them a little bit better and split it up. This next bone, okay, this U-shaped bone is actually found in your throat, and I wish that I had a better image to show you where that's at, but right now I want you to take your hand while you're listening to this, find your chin, and at the bottom of your chin, start taking your hand towards your, towards your neck, and right there where it bends, where your chin bends and it makes your neck, that's right, right around your Adam's apple. At the top of your Adam's apple is actually the front of your larynx, and above, right above the Adam's apple, is where we're going to find this bone. This bone actually helps to pull that skin and almost create that corner there between your chin and your neck in your throat. Okay, so this U-shaped bone, it almost looks like it's got little teeth. It's not a baby's jaw. This is actually called your hyoid bone. So the hyoid, if I ever say in the throat, then it's got to be the hyoid bone. Okay, this keeps the larynx open. It's the only bony component of the larynx, so it keeps it open so that air can continue to go in and out. And if this is crushed, then you're going to start to suffocate. You're not going to be able to breathe, and so it's definitely going to be a bad thing. Now, the auditory ossicles are listed next on my list. I'm not going to cover those in this chapter on this test. We're going to cover those whenever we do the ear, okay? So I'm not concerned about those right now. Now, to finish up the skull, because we still had just a couple of things that we had to do with the skull, let's take a look at the sutures. Sutures, and as you can see here, it looks like these parts have been sewn together, and that's how it got its name, is it looks like it's been sutured together. So these sutures are the connections between the flat bones in the skull. Okay, and so here we can see a connection between the frontal bone and the two parietal bones. And so the back side of the frontal bone, this is called the sagittal suture, and then behind it, connecting the two parietal bones together, we see this, excuse me, I said that wrong. This is the frontal suture. Oh my goodness. This is the frontal suture. I'm so sorry, guys. I got a little distracted there. Here's the frontal suture, also called the coronal suture. I think I just told you that was the squamosal suture, or the sagittal suture, sorry. So this is the frontal suture or the coronal suture. It's right behind the frontal bone. Corona refers to crown, and this is kind of that crown region. Now, right down the middle, right? And that term right down the middle refers to sagittal. And connecting the two parietal bones, this is our sagittal suture. Okay, so there's the sagittal suture. Whenever we look from behind, again, at the top of the occipital bone, we see this upside down V-shaped suture. And here it really looks like sewn together. This is called the lambdoidal suture. The lambda letter in the Greek alphabet is an upside down V. And so that's where we get that term. Now on each side of the skull, we see this crack connecting the temporal bone to the parietal bone. And this is called the squamosal suture. So the squamous or the squamosal suture. So this is in that flat part on the side above the ear, the squamous part. So we just name it the squamosal suture. Now, as we've mentioned, your bones began as cartilage. And so as these bones are fusing and changing, 
Originally inside mama, here is what your fetal skull kind of looked like. Here's from above, here's from behind, and here's from the side. Instead of sutures, because these, these bones haven't fused yet, we have what are referred to as fontanelles. So the fontanelles are what people traditionally call the squishy spots or the soft spots in the baby's skull. And so here we can see this major fontanelle that a lot of people are concerned with. You know, they hold the baby's skull very carefully um, after birth because, again, this is a fetal skull, not really a baby's skull, but the baby's skull is very similar. Um, this is called the anterior fontanelle or the frontal fontanelle. Okay, either way, anterior or frontal fontanelle. Back here we see this lambdoidal suture starting to form. And right in the junction of that, at the top of the upside down V, this is called either the posterior fontanelle or the occipital fontanelle. Either way. Now on each side, and these are usually the two spots that that parents and other people are concerned about protecting, but there's also two squishy spots on each side of the baby's skull. Right here where the sphenoid is developing, this little squishy spot <clears throat> is called the sphenoidal sphenoid fontanelle, or this is not listed in our lab manual, but you can also refer to it as the anterior lateral fontanelle. The anterior lateral fontanelle front and to the side, Back here where the mastoid process is slowly developing, there's another squishy spot. This is called the mastoid mastoidal fontanelle or the posterior lateral fontanelle. Okay, so all that besides the hyoid bone basically wraps up the skull. If our test were to be 75 questions, then approximately 25 of those questions are going to be on the skull. So definitely take the time to learn all of this information as fast as you can and get it in and prepare as quickly as possible. Now, to complete the rest of the axial skeleton, we have to discuss the ribs, the rib cage, and the vertebrae. So let's flip over and let's take a look at our vertebrae. First off, here on this side is a basic vertebral column. When we look at this basic vertebral column, I've tried to add it to the next three vertebrae images so that you kind of still have a reference. Here towards the top, we have cervical vertebrae. We have seven of those, and then we have 12 of these thoracic vertebrae, and then we have five lumbar vertebrae before we have the fused lumbar vertebrae that became the sac sacrum down here. Okay, and at the tip of the sacrum, we have the coccyx, and this is your tailbone. Okay, so you can kind of see that crack separating them. This image is of a cervical vertebrae, but what I want to do first is go over here and kind of use our lumbar vertebrae, the nice big one, as a um, representation of a typical vertebrae. So let's start and let's cover some of these parts under typical vertebrae first. The main part of this bone, again, anytime I say main part, usually I'm looking for body. Here is the body, and hanging off of the vertebral body, we have what's called the vertebral arch. Now, I'm not the biggest fan of that term. Um, I would rather you know the parts of the vertebral arch, so in my opinion, you can mark that term off, but at least you've been exposed to it and you've heard it. What goes around the hole, the spinal cord, is called the vertebral arch, and that hole itself is called the vertebral foramen. Okay, this is where the spinal cord enters. Now, out to the sides, we can see here, and we can also kind of see here on this side view, these are called transverse processes. Now, for some reason, I don't understand why this is there in our lab manual. We have the word transverse foramen listed. That should be listed only under cervical vertebrae. Only cervical vertebrae have a transverse foramen, and that's important for the blood vessels to go in and out of the skull. And so move that term transverse foramen away from typical vertebrae. Not all vertebrae have that, and put it under cervical vertebrae as one of the parts under bifid spinous process. Now, we can also see this things sticking out towards the back and if you put your hand on your back and you run it up and down your spine you'll feel all those bumps and these are called your spinous processes so there's your spinous processes and your transverse processes then we see some processes that hang down and some processes that stick up and these two interlock so the upper vertebrae fits inside these with this part, right? And so this way it locks these bones together and that way they can't spin, they can't twist and separate kind of 
rotate and, and really do damage to your spinal cord. So this one up here is called the superior articular process. And this one down here is called the inferior articular process. Articular just means to come together. So at the top, there's a part that comes together and at the bottom, there's a part that comes together. Not that difficult, okay? Now, if we look really close here, we can see in between most of these vertebrae, we have these tiny little discs, especially when we get down to the lumbars, they get bigger. So we can see there's a good one right there. You know, we see these intervertebral discs. So these discs are little pads of fibrocartilage in between the bodies of all the vertebrae, and that kind of pads them all together, provides a little flexibility and a little bit of strength. And we'll talk about those discs being a symphysis joint, a symphysial joint, when we get to chapter nine. We'll learn a little bit more about that in lecture. These holes that are created when the superior articular process of the lower vertebrae meets the inferior articular process of the upper vertebrae, we can see these holes from the side. These are called intervertebral foramen, and these intervertebral foramen are important for the nerves to come in and out of the spinal cord. So if you have a disc like right here that's bulging into that intervertebral foramen, then you're going to be compressing on a nerve, and that's going to start to be very painful. So a pinched nerve, a compressed nerve due to a slipped disc or a herniated disc is always a painful thing. Now, we, as I mentioned, we've got cervical, we've got thoracic, and then we've got lumbar. But I want to start with the very first cervical vertebrae. This is a special vertebrae. This is listed for us. For me, it's on the top of the page. It says atypical vertebra. And this is the atlas. This is C1. So this is the first cervical vertebrae. Here, we notice it doesn't have a body. Okay, It doesn't have a body because the vertebrae underneath it has a really tall body. And what that allows them to do is to kind of fit together and here is the atlas on top, and here is the vertebrae underneath it called the axis. And so here the axis creates the body for the atlas, but what it allows the axis to do is to rotate. So right now I want you to say no, right? Earlier I told you to say no, and I meant to tell you to say yes. If you're saying yes, you're pivoting on the occipital condyles right here um, on the atlas, but if you say no, then you're pivoting right here on the dens um, on this odontoid process of the axis. And so let's go back and let's take a look at this. I just got, kind of explained it a little bit. Again, this is C1, the atlas, and these pads that I just mentioned meet up with the occipital condyles, and I think I incorrectly told you earlier, if you say yes, not no, but if you say yes and move your head back and forth, up and down, then you're pivoting occipital condyles on these lateral masses, okay? Now, the vertebrae below it, again, is called the axis, and the axis has this feature right here that sticks up. It becomes kind of the body for the atlas, and this is called the dens or the, or the odontoid process. Dont means tooth, right? So it kind of looks like a tooth, and that's how it got its name. Now, again, these two fit together. Pivoting occipital condyles up here allows you to say yes, and then rotating back and forth on this dens allows you to say no. Okay, so if you do those two motions, then you're working both of those vertebrae. Now, below that, we have your typical cervical vertebrae. And here's a view of a typical cervical vertebrae. I don't really care for this view from the side. I really kind of prefer to look at it this way. When we look at this vertebrae, there's two things that pop out. First off, this is not as forked as it should be. It should be more forked. This spinous process is said to be bifid if it has a fork. Okay. Also, if we see these holes to the side, the only vertebrae that have these transverse foramen are cervical vertebrae. So if you see either of those two features, holes to the side or a bifid spinous process, then you know you're looking at a cervical vertebrae. Also, let's think about this logically. A cervical vertebrae is higher up in your vertebral column. So should it have to take more weight or less weight? And if it takes more or less, what size should the body be in order to do that? So if you think logically, the higher up we are, the less weight that it takes, right? So the higher up in our vertebral column, the less weight that it takes. Now, that shows us that this body is going to be smaller in a cervical vertebrae compared to a thoracic vertebrae 
and compared to a lumbar vertebrae. So they're going to get bigger as we go down through the vertebral column. So again, key features of cervical, bifid spinous process, we have transverse foramen, and we have a small body. Okay. Next, we have the um, thoracic vertebrae. When we look at this vertebrae, the easiest way to, to know this one is to look at it from the side. And we notice that the spinous process hangs down below the body, telltale sign that we have a thoracic vertebrae. So here, this is a thoracic vertebrae. If you look really close, you can almost see some little horns sticking up, some ears sticking out, and this almost looks like a little giraffe face from the side. If you can look at it from a different angle, so I've always told my students, giraffic is thoracic, right? This big nose kind of of the giraffe. Um, some people say it kind of looks like an elephant, okay? But there, the one that has the nose that hangs down below the body is the thoracic. And then here we get the big fat one. And the big fat one, if you look, it looks like it's got a blunt nose. It's got these antlers. It's got some ears and some jowls hanging down. It almost looks like a moose, right? So here, this big bodied, and it's kind of more ornate than the rest. Then this is our moose vertebrae, which is our lumbar vertebrae, which is in the bottom of that vertebral column. Now, as we move forward, we're going to get, oh, I don't have a good view of the sacrum for some reason. I thought that I had a good view of the sacrum, but I didn't. Let me just show you right here. Here is the sacrum. Oh, wait, I do. Here it is. Excellent. So here's the sacrum. Again, right here is the end of the lumbar vertebrae. And so these are actually, and you can even see, these are old lumbar vertebrae that have just fused together. You can even see some of the fusion points where those intervertebral discs have disintegrated over, you know, millions of years, thousands of years, hundreds of thousands. And so here we can see that these old lumbar vertebrae fuse together to take the hips. The hip bones are going to attach out here. And then what we're doing with this is transferring all the weight from our vertebral column out to our hips. So right here needs to be our strongest part. The more we stress a bone, the thicker it gets. So we can see that we really stress this sacrum towards the top, not as much towards the bottom. The only real thing that I might ask with the sacrum would be these holes. And these holes are the sacral foramen, sacral foramina. Um, you know, if foramina is a plural of foramen, so if you put foramen, I would take that on a test. Um, also, the main part. So here, if we look at this main part right here of the sacrum, you can call it the body of the sacrum, or you can call it the sacral ala, A-L-A. -A. So A-L-A -A is an old word that refers to the body of a of something. Usually it's uh, referred religiously, um, you know, traditionally. And so it's referring to the body of a god or of a deity. And so here the Allah is the main body of the sacrum. Out here to the sides, we kind of see these dips, these rough dips on each side. This is where, towards the top, this is where the hip bones, the coxal bones are going to attach. And so this is called the auricular surface, or it could also be referred to as the sacroiliac articulation. Either way, we'll cover that word sacroiliac articulation when we get over to the ilium and we get to the hip bones. Now, again, this tailbone, this is a terrible tailbone right here. It's kind of mangled a little bit. It should be kind of sharp, almost look like a rattlesnake rattle. The tailbone is the coccyx. And so this is, um, you know, we had a tail as we were developing inside of our mamas. And over time, you know, before we were born, that tail kind of absorbed into our body. And this is what's left over of that tail. So in order to have a vertebrae, we all had to have a tail at some point in our development. That's just a requirement. And so all vertebrates have a tail. And so ours is not visible in the adult state, but in our embryological and fetal state, there are you know, remnants of a tail. Now, to start to finish this up, we've really got this one last slide. And when we look at this one last slide, we can see here is your rib cage. Okay, here's the sternum. You can kind of see there's the clavicle and the scapula attaching. So there's going to be where we start with the next um, slides when we get to the next presentation. There's our pe pectoral girdle. Okay, but here we see the last of the axial skeleton. Here's our sternum. The sternum is found in three parts. The upper part is called the manubrium. The main part in the middle is called the body. Again, in main parts, body. And what hangs down here between the ribs in the front is called your xiphoid process. If you've learned CPR, they taught you to find this 
it's cart cartilage in the ribs, chase it up, find this little point, put two fingers over on top of this, and then put your fist above it. And then that way you're actually, your fist is on the body of the sternum. The heart's right behind the body of the sternum right here. And so in order to do CPR, you want to pump on the body, not on the xiphoid process. This helps you breathe. This attaches to your diaphragm. So if you break this off, then the person, if they do come to, they're going to have trouble with that that pulmonary component of the CPR, right, of breathing. And so you got to be careful giving CPR. Up here at the top, we're going to see this notch, okay, this little cut at the top of the manubrium. This is called the jugular notch, named after the blood vessels that kind of start to merge right here, come out of the neck, come out of the head, excuse me, the skull. And here is the jugular notch, and you can even feel that. Put your finger kind of in between your collarbones, and you can feel that notch at the very top of your sternum. Now, let's take a look at the rib. Here is a basic rib. It's kind of a little bit out of proportion, but we can see that one side is going to attach to the sternum, and if you follow it around to the back side, it attaches to the vertebrae. And so this end that's flat, right, we can even see it right here. The end that's flat is called the sternal end or the sternal extremity, and this other end has got a little bump about an inch down. This end is called the vertebral end, and this attaches to the body of the vertebrae, and then this many times attaches to a transverse process. So it just kind of stabilizes that rib to our to our backbone. Now, whenever we look at the vertebral end, we've got three parts. We've got an expanded beginning part called the head, and we've got this constriction just a little bit right past it called the neck. And then we've got this bump, as I mentioned, that likes to attach to some of those transverse processes. And this bump is called the costal tubercle. So the costal tubercle, a tubercle is usually where we see ligaments attaching um, something to another bone. And so here the costal refers to the ribs. Intercostal refer in between ribs. So we're going to start to see that term. Costal means rib, intercostal means between ribs. Now we've got three flavors of ribs and this is a little bit tough to see because you can't see all of these ribs down here at the bottom. You can barely see the last one kind of in the background right there and in the background right here. Now not all ribs are attached by cartilage. We've got these two pairs down here that just freely, right? And not all ribs are attached directly to the sternum by cartilage. If you are a rib that attaches directly to the sternum by your own cartilage, nobody else, you're not sharing it, it's your own, then you're a true rib. So let's count the cartilages attaching. One, two, three, four, five, six. So the true ribs are actually, wait, there's one right there. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Sorry about that. I'm, I missed that first one. So there are seven true ribs. Okay, so there's one up here that you can't really see very well. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now, if you notice, eight, nine, and ten, they have cartilage. They don't go directly to the sternum. Instead, they merge into number seven's cartilage. So these are not true ribs. We call these false ribs. But they're not floating. They're not detached. So we call them false non-floating ribs. That's what I want you to call them. Eight and ten are false non-floating ribs. Now, again, down at the bottom, you can kind of see them in the background. There is a pair of floating ribs. These are called your false floating ribs. Again, most humans, you know, you can be a mutant, you can be different, but most humans have the same numbers of ribs. You know, there's a, a creation myth that discuss how man gave a rib to create a woman. That's really just a myth, you know, because we can see that women have the same amount of ribs that men have. And so men don't have one less rib. That's really just kind of this myth that's been per perpetrated um, within, you know, that religion. So don't be confused. We're all kind of the same thing. You know, it's just minor differences, um, but definitely we all have the same amount of ribs. All right. At that point, we have just finished the first half of our skeleton, and that took a long time. So I want you to understand what we've done so far. The skull is about one third of your test. All of this today that we've covered is approximately one half of your test. And so that means that the difference between 
that half and that third, right? So that little extra bit in there, you know, half is 50%, a third is 33%. So that 17% right there, that's going to be covering the vertebrae and the rib cage overall. Okay, so make sure that you're studying for this. This is going to be our this test that we hit first. So I want everybody to knock its socks off and get an A. So make sure that you're studying this over and over and over again as often as you can. Um, make sure that you're practicing labeling. We're going to see some of these same pictures on our test, and we're going to have to label these pictures. So make sure that you practice labeling these pictures. Try to um, find a way to print some of these pictures up out of your um, lab manual, and then and, you know, either use flashcards or use some kind of labeling activity to help drill yourself to kind of put yourself in the testing environment and prepare you for the Isle of Tests. All right, make sure that you're practicing your spelling as well. And as long as you're staying up on this information and you're learning this as quick as you can, you're going to do excellent on this test. I know that you can, um, but it, this test requires a lot of effort compared to a lot of our other tests. All right. I hope that you guys have enjoyed. If you have any questions, contact me. Otherwise, study hard and before you know it, go watch that next appendicular section on the skeleton. Have a great day, folks.